And then I want to say, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker tonight, um, Shelby Lawson. And so, <clears throat> oh, wait, my computer just completely freaked out. <laughs> this always happens, right? Um, yeah, so I'm very pleased to introduce you tonight to Shelby Lawson, uh, who will be telling us how red winged blackbirds eavesdrop on yellow warblers as a frontline defense mechanism against cowbirds. Um, Shelby is a PhD student in, or PhD candidate, sorry, in Dr. Mark Halber's lab at UIUC. And Shelby has published her research in prestig prestigious journals. And uh, for example, the research that she's going to tell us about tonight um, has been published in the well-known communications biology. And her research has also been featured in press and media, and you might have actually seen it in a uh, uh, recently seen it in a, a national Audubon newsletter. And uh, with that, um, I'll hand over to you, Shelby. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. We're very excited. Thanks, Alita. That was lovely. I'm, I'm so excited to speak here tonight. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited because uh, even though most of my work in my PhD focuses on yellow warblers, this is probably the most exciting thing to come out of my PhD. And it's funny because it's not yellow warblers, even though it's tangentially related to it, but it's all red-winged blackbirds, which are the most common bird in the United States. Um, but they're super cool. And I want to tell you uh, today about something cool that I found out that they do. So look like that. And hopefully all the sounds and everything work that I'm trying to get going. So my focus is on communication. Um, and just to start at like square one in any kind of communication setting, we're gonna have a sender and a receiver. Um, and as you might imagine, especially with vocal signals, when you put those out into the wild, um, they can be picked up by others. Um, so for example, uh, you can get unintended receiver who can be of the same species, so a conspecific or of a different species like a header specific. Um, so this comes from a paper from Templeton's lab where they look at these chickadees who send out different alarm calls to each other and find out that these nuthatches also listen in and can tell what type of predator is being warned about based on the alarm calls. Uh, so a really cool example of header specific eavesdropping. Now one might wonder why would you eavesdrop on others in the first place? Uh, well, some things that come to mind are that they might be better at detecting certain predators or maybe that they're uh, better at finding certain food sources. Or um, in the case of yellow warblers, which I study, um, they can use each other to pick up cues for where to nest. So like, what are safe places to nest in? Where's everyone else nesting? Because I want to nest there too. Um, but then, you know, header specific, or sorry, con specifics can do all that stuff too. So why, why specifically eavesdrop on header specifics? Um, so, you know, because they might have different sensory abilities. So they might have better hearing, uh, better sight, better smell to pick up predators, pick up food, all that good stuff. They might also live in different spots. So uh, it's well established that there are warblers that live in different spots on the trees. Um, so the warbler that's at the top might have a predators um, than the one on the bottom, or maybe the one on the bottom picks up uh, ground foraging predators instead. Um, so you can get different information by paying attention to uh, who's where. And then what I specifically focus on uh, are animals that have better or more sophisticated communication systems, uh, ways of warning or telling each other about specific objects in the environment. Um, so this is kind of what I'm going to focus on today. So I use a chicken because uh, what this thing is called is a functional reference call, and it was first discovered in chickens. So chickens have a specific call they make to flying predators. So if they see a hawk overhead like this, they'll make this call. Just This is like a really old spectrogram of the call. Um, and other chickens that hear this call immediately just bolt and try to find cover from said hawk. Um, so they basically make a specific sound to the flying predator, uh, and they have a specific behavioral response uh, when they hear it. So this call to them, essentially, it means flying predator. Um, so functional reference calls, again, reference a specific object and have a specific behavioral response. They don't just have one for flying predators, too. They actually have one for ground predators, so for things like raccoons or foxes. Um, they'll make this more like deep, 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 deep type call. Uh, and when they hear that, instead of running off to find cover, which really doesn't work for ground predators, um, it causes everyone to stand up really tall and scan the ground looking for what they're warning about on the ground. So the behavior is not only linked to the object, but it's, it should be adaptive to the object that you're referring to. So this is ground predator. Uh, okay. Um, and so 
Eavesdropping on calls like this, referential calls that have specific meaning, is not new. Um, it's actually already been seen a bunch in the animal kingdom. So there's this really cool example with these Diana monkeys that have alarm calls that are specific to the crowned eagle or other flying predators that they're depredated by, as well as leopards, which they're also depredated by. What's really interesting is that black cast hornbills that live nearby are only depredated by the, horn, or the crowned eagle, not by the leopard. So when you hear the call by the Diana monkey, that means crowned eagle, you get some kind of scare response. They look around for the predator and try to avoid the predator. But when they hear the call for the leopard, which they're not threatened by at all, uh, they tend to just ignore it. They just don't respond to it. Um, so here's an example of listening on a call that's very specific and means something, and they only act when it actually is pertinent to them. And so getting to what I study, I study yellow warblers, um, super cute very cool birds that have their own referential alarm call, but it's not for a predator and it's not for a food source. It's for something rather unique. Uh, they warn about brood parasites like this cowbird. And so I'm sure everyone here knows uh, what a cowbird is, but just in case you've never heard of one, um, cowbirds are brood parasites. So they go around finding nests of other species. Um, it's like, oh, there's a nest. Uh, and then you get a cowbird egg in the nest. And so they leave their eggs and other nests for the host to care for. Um, and so this is kind of uh, costly, especially for a lot of different hosts. It, it takes a lot to raise a cowbird young, especially if you get hit by more than one. Uh, and so yellow warblers have actually evolved a really cool call called the seat call that they give to warn each other about nearby brood parasites, specifically brown-headed cowbirds. And I actually have a recording for it in case um, you haven't heard this before. <laughs> So that was a seat belt. Um, they don't always produce them in belts. Sometimes they just do a singular seat um, because one seat's enough to, to get it to happen. But a lot of times they also produce them in these seat belts. And so to them, that means cowbird and they understand it to be that way. Uh, this is different from other yellow warbler alarm calls like the chip call, which is their general anti-predator um, aggressive call. Uh, so they make this call specifically in a couple of different contexts, uh, nest predators like the blue jay, grackle, uh, they'll make it towards adult predators like hawks and owls uh, and it's also used a lot in social settings so when they're fighting with other males or establishing territory or mating um, they'll also use the chip call so it's, it's a very general just aggressive alarm call and i have that sound too so very short nice little sweet chip. Uh, so it's a different type of call and they respond differently to these calls. So the uh, seat call is only produced pretty much exclusively to cowbirds. And I even added females because they do make it sometimes to male cowbirds, but it's mostly the female cowbirds, which are the threat. You know, the males don't lay eggs on their bird's nests. The females do that. Um, and when they hear the seat call, it actually gets this adaptive behavior where they fly back to their nest and they sit on it, presumably to prevent the cowbird from inspecting a nest and, and laying an egg or doing anything with that nest. So it's super cool. Uh, really adaptive behavioral response. We also find this with cowbird chatter calls and seat calls. So not only is it just the model, but you can put out sounds of the cowbird or seat calls themselves, and they all get this behavior from the yellow warbler. This call is also dependent on the risk that brood parasites pose to a nest, which is uh, really cool as well. So cowbirds have to lay their eggs um, when the nest has eggs in order to time their cowbird hatch and have it hatch with the rest of the brood or even before it. Um, so during this stage, they're really vulnerable to brood parasitism. So if you play seat calls at this stage or you show them a cowbird, you get lots of seeding. But if you wait till after the eggs hatch, at this point, cowbirds really can't do that much. Um, you know, if they lay an egg, it's gonna to be too late. Uh, so cowbirds aren't really a risk anymore. Um, so you don't really get so much seeding if you show them a cowbird or show them a seed call at this stage, they just tend to ignore it. We also found uh, recently, this is something I just got accepted for publication, so I thought I'd, thought I'd throw it in, um, but I also tested the before stage. So if we know what happens during egg and nestling stage, what happens when a bird hasn't even made a net, uh, got a mate yet or made a nest yet? Um, so it's like the pre-nesting stage. Uh, and we found they also, you know, kind of unsurprisingly, don't produce seat calls at this stage. So males that don't yet have a female partner um, and have their own territory but haven't started a nest or anything yet, they don't really care about seat calls um, and they don't really produce that much seat calls, especially the cowbirds. They don't seem to care that much about cowbirds at that stage. Thought I'd throw that in. But like I said, this talk really isn't so much about yellow warblers, but it's about rubbing blackbirds. 
Uh, and the reason it is, is because we were wondering, there's so many species that are parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds, and a lot of those overlap with yellow warblers and their habitats. So if anyone's going to be eavesdropping on calls, if you are a bird who's affected by cowbirds, why not eavesdrop on a seek call? Because it means something specific. So it specifically warns about cowbirds. These yellow warblers aren't just producing it in random contexts. And it's only going to be made during the breeding season when these guys have eggs. So it's very uh, specific information that can be very useful for uh, a bird's own frontline nest defense. So this is the question we pose. Do any heterospecific species eavesdrop on yellow warbler seek calls? So um, truthfully, this kind of came out randomly. I wasn't like so prepared in my PhD that I went out and said, let's answer this question. Uh, it was kind of an accident because I was doing another experiment at the time for yellow warblers where I was going out and presenting seek calls to these yellow warbler pairs. And we were just tacking out a bunch of information like who came in, um, how many were alarm calling because I mostly just wanted to keep track of how many came into the chip call because it's, it's just a general aggressive call. But when I tallied it up, I noticed that these red-winged blackbirds were coming in uh, a lot to these seek calls and producing like these check or chit alarm calls, uh, which they use. And so I was like, okay, let's actually tally it up and see if there's an actual difference here. And so uh, this graph here shows the percentage of trials that I did on yellow warbler territories that red-winged blackbirds entered. So if it's blue, it means the red-winged blackbird entered it and actually alarm called, it didn't just sit there. Um, and then green means they weren't present in the territory. And so what we found was that about half the trials of cavalry call and seek call, revving blackbirds were coming in pretty much off their territory into yeah, the warbler territories to see what was going on. And this was higher than we saw for the chip call, which again is just the general alarm call. Um, it was higher than blue jay calls and it was higher than the control. So we thought maybe there was something worth investing here. Um, and honestly, if there's any bird that's going to be able to understand what a yellow warbler call means, uh, red winged blackbirds are great candidates. Um, for one, we already know from past experiments that they have a sophisticated enemy recognition system. So lots of past experiments have showed that um, they are able to identify brood parasites. They can tell it apart from nest predators and even conspecific intruders when you show them different models. Um, and so it really wouldn't be hard to just tack on uh, a yellow warbler seek call in this kind of experiment. And instead of using models, just make everything a, a vocalization instead and see if they understand what seek calls mean and that they mean cowbird, um, you would expect very similar responses between uh, the brood parasite call and the seek call. And so this is what we set out to do. Um, oh, also uh, there's past evidence that uh, yellow warblers already benefit from nesting near red winged blackbirds because as you might have seen, uh, red winged blackbirds are really aggressive when they're nesting. Um, and so they're pretty good about keeping away cowbirds, even if they don't necessarily prevent parasitism, they're, they're pretty good about beating them up. Uh, and so yellow warblers that nest near red winged blackbirds benefit from this. And you'll see that yellow warblers that nest near them have less parasitism, uh, according to this older study here. And so it wouldn't be impossible to think about them having a mutual relationship where uh, rubbing blackbirds are kind of a muscle that help protect the yellow warblers and the yellow warblers uh, provide the, the warning signals to benefit the rubbing blackbirds. So this is a pretty good candidate bird for who would be able to understand this call. So for this experiment, we had some predictions here. If they truly are eavesdropping on seek calls and they understand it as a defense against brute parasitism, we should expect for one, seek calls should be responded with similar urgency as other threat signaling calls. And two, the aggressive responses should be most similar towards cowbird and seek calls. And it should be different from other signals to danger. And that's that's the real kicker there is that it can't just be the same as everything else. It has to be cowbird and seat are treated differently than say a nest predator or a conspecific intruder. So uh, it was like two or three years ago, I set out to do this. Um, so we went to go find nests that were in incubation stage and nests that had eggs. Uh, and we found these uh, male and female red winged blackbirds and we did playback treatments. So we did seek calls, cowbird chatter, which of course signals the threat of root parasitism. And keep in mind, if they understand that seek calls mean cowbird, then seek calls technically also signal the threat of root parasitism. It's just a different um, communicator here. We also did blue jay calls, which signals the threat of nest predation. We did red winged blackbird chatter, which of course is a conspecific territory intrusion, so a threat to you know your territory. And then for the control, I did with thrush song, um, so they they live somewhat in the same areas, but they're not um, threatening in any way. 
And so in these, we did 10 minute trials uh, where we just played it back and measured different behaviors. And we tested a focal male and focal female twice. And I say focal because uh, revving blackbirds are polygonous. So they have often multiple females and multiple nests in their territory. Um, and so whenever we find a nest that was in the right stage to test, we would wait and see who was the female that owned it um, before starting the trial. And so we just watched that one female. And then of course we could watch the male because he owns the territory. Um, that way we just get the behaviors of the owners of that nest. And then so during it, um, I, I measured a little bit more than this, but for today, I'm just gonna mostly focus on um, response latency. So how many seconds it took to either acknowledge that the playback is happening and like move towards it or alarm call or do some threat display. Um, and then I also measured the number of alarm calls that they produced. So we looked at like chats, chicks, tongues, cheers, all these different calls that rubbing blackbirds make. They have so many calls. Um, we just kind of looked at the combined amount of all of those. And then I analyzed these with different general linear models, taking into account what day it was in the season, whether this was their first or second trial, um, and then year, because it actually went across two different years. And I analyzed the sexes separately. Oh, and so I have uh, a couple of videos. So this first one, um, I hope you can see my mouse cursor. So over here, this is the speaker. It kind of blends into the plant. We have like a green speaker. And so this will be a rubbing blackbird responding to a cowbird chatter playback. So here the cowbird chatter kind of repeat on like a five second loop. And this guy will come in to inspect it. Yeah, so he's coming in, he's pretty aggressive. Um, this guy, I don't think actually ever landed on the speaker, but we had others that actually like would land on the speaker and peck at it. Um, so that was really cool. We also had this one. This guy is not so much aggressive, but it was just really funny. Um, so this one's to a Red Wing Blackbird playback. Uh, the speaker is right behind this pole here. This is Heron County Park. Um, if anyone has never been there, it's super pretty. And there's a lot of Red Wing Blackbirds there and a lot of cool stuff to see. Um, so you'll see us there in the spring if you ever go. Um, yeah, so the speaker's behind this pole and this guy just wasn't really aggressive, but more was just so confused because he didn't see the rubbing blackbird. And so he just goes uh, to each side of the pole multiple times and I'll show you because it's just really funny. I love the way he just walks over like, oh, he's not on this side. It must be on the other side. Where is he? <laughs> Wasn't that aggressive, but sometimes we had variation like that. It was still really funny. So let's go into the results. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the males and then we'll go to the females. So this first graph, let me just orient you a little bit. So this is latency. So we go from zero to 600 seconds on the y axis. 600 seconds is the longest a trial could have been. So if you see dots up top, like here, these are trials where birds just didn't respond the entire, um, the entire trial. This graph is, uh, it's like a box plot, but uh, instead of being um, like the standard deviations, this is actually a standard error. So this is if it was a bar graph with the error bars, except you just take the error bars and fill them in. Um, so you can see really tight ranges uh, are like really good and less error and then bigger ranges have more error. And then each dot of course is its own trial. And then the letters here signify um, statistical differences. So if they're different letters, they're statistically different from each other. And I also have the sample sizes here, which were too bad. So first, just looking at the latency for males, um, it's immediately clear that these three non-controlled treatments, that being the cowbird chatter, the seat, 
the Blue Jay call and the, the Blackbird chatter are being responded to almost instantly. You can see a lot of these dots down here are at zero, which means pretty much we started the playback and the bird immediately came over and landed and alarm called and was just very loud. Um, and this is very different than the width arch control over here, which um, about half the birds didn't even respond to. Um, and then the other half kind of responded, but they took their time. So clearly responding very quickly to seats along with these other non-controls, um, not so much to the control. When we look at alarm calling, um, again, it's the same type of setup on this graph. And we can see that cowbird chatter, seat, and blue jay, that are alarm calling quite a bit. The alarm calling the most to red wing blackbird chatter and then they're hardly alarm calling at all to the width dress song. So what does this mean? Um, clearly they're giving the highest aggression to other conspecifics who are coming in their territory and threatening you know, their nests in our territory, um, but they're still responding quite aggressively to our seek call. And it's actually, it was almost the same exact mean as the cowbird chatter, which was cool, um, but it's also the same as the blue jay, which again, we wanted to tease apart these aggressive responses between these different threats. Um, and so here it's, it's, they're the same. When we look at the females, first we look at latency. We actually see the same pattern as we did for males. Um, the females tend to wait a little bit longer before responding than the males, um, but we still see the same pattern where the non-control treatments, so the different chatters, the seat and the blue jay uh, are being responded to pretty quickly. Um, and then the wood thrush, it's, most females didn't even respond. There's like two females that actually did something and the rest just completely ignored the control. So they are responding pretty quickly to the seat along with the other non-controls not so much to the control. When we look at alarm calling, it's actually the same pattern as we saw for males, except that they don't alarm call quite as much as the males do. Um, but we still see that Blackbird chatter is given the highest priority. So they're alarm calling the most to other conspecifics coming in. Um, they're still alarm calling a good bit to the, the Cowbird chatter, the Seat and the Blue Jay. Um, and they're not really alarm calling at all to the Wood Thresh song. I also want to show you this cool pattern we found where um, we basically measured how far each red winged blackbird was from a yellow warbler territory. Um, and we found this neat pattern where if you were a red winged blackbird that nested really close to a yellow warbler, uh, you actually responded much more to seat calls and cowbird calls than those that nested further away. And it's statistically significant here. So clearly having proximity to that information and having it available to you in form of seat call um, they, they seem to respond more aggressively to that information. So summarizing the incubation stage, this is where our predictions. We said that seat calls should be responded to with similar urgency as other threat signaling calls. Definitely true. Seat calls are pretty much the same as cowbird chatter and blue jay. Um, and that aggressive response should be most similar to cowbird chatter and blue and, and seat calls. Uh, and that was true. Their means were extremely close most of the time. They were really overlapping each other. Um, the one problem was that they were also similar to Blue Jay. So Blue Jay was not significantly different from these two. And so we can't at that point figure out, is it actually that they understand that cowbird, uh, that sea calls mean cowbird, or are they just responding to it because it's another type of alarm call and they're just good at picking up alarm calls. So we went back to the drawing board and this is where I realized I needed to throw in one more prediction and do one more experiment. So we needed to see if response to cowbird and seat calls actually changed based on the risk of root parasitism. Remember how I said that yellow warblers seat more during incubation when they're actually at risk to root parasites, but then when you wait to nestling stage, they don't seat that much. Uh, if blackbirds are listening to seat calls, they should show the same pattern where we get this high response during incubation and they kind of should ignore it um, during nestling stage. And this isn't really new. Um, this has been tested with models, uh, not including a seat call, obviously, but they've uh, been tested with models for root parasites and nest predators. And they found that during the laying and incubation stage, they saw these really aggressive responses to cowbirds, but also really aggressive responses to nest predators like brackles, um, to the point where most of these studies couldn't tell them apart at laying and incubation stage. And it actually wasn't until you get the nestling stage um, that we saw that this decreased response to root parasites because they were no longer a threat, whereas nest predators either are maintained or the aggression increases over time as these birds put more investment into their eggs and then the cost of renesting because of a nest predator increases over time. And so we realized we needed to do a nestling stage study to really tease apart this response and answer this question.
Okay, so uh, basically the same exact setup for the nestling stage, um, besides the fact that it's it's nestlings. Uh, we did drop the blackbird chatter call just because it was pretty clear that they were the most aggressive to that, and that wasn't really going to help us tease apart these responses. We just really needed the blue jay seat and cowbird to tease those apart, and then of course our control. So we did 10 minute trials again. We recorded the same exact behaviors, did the same thing where we tested the focal male and focal female um, with the same measures. Uh, but this time we also recorded the age of the nestlings in the nest in case, uh, you know, like older nestlings, maybe they, uh, maybe the parents are more aggressive when they have older nestlings. I also recorded if the males had any nests of eggs on territory, because remember they're polygonous. So um, they could have nests with nestlings at the same exact time that they also have nests of eggs, which we thought might mess up um, our stuff. And we wanted to see, you know, the, do eggs matter uh, on the territory. So I have some more videos here. Turns out when they have nestlings, they are super aggressive uh, to you and will attack you. So here's a video of my point of view when I was going to check a nest um, and these guys were just super mean to me. <laughs> the nest right in there. Like I actually kicked my phone <laughs> and I was holding my phone camera and he just flapped and kicked at it. Oh, and here's a video of my poor field tech. Uh, he was super helpful and great. Um, but I had him check some nests that were in nestling stage and I had him do it on what we called the aggressive duo who were the worst and they bit and kicked whenever you check their nest. Um, and so I have really good video here of him getting assaulted by a red winged blackbird as he checks the nest. I I'm telling him during the video where the nest is. To your left more. Yep. And it's like down in there. <laughs> I see it. I see it. It's got chicks. <laughs> I see their little mouths. <laughs> so funny. I, I love these guys. Uh, so aggressive. <laughs> so let's look at the results again, males first and then females. So this is the latency, um, same exact setup where it's an error bar box plot essentially um, with zero to 600 seconds on the y-axis. Same treatments in the same order, it's just there's no longer blackbird treatment there. Um, and so first I just wanna point out that uh, during the nestling stage, we can see that um, they uh, respond extremely quickly to blue jay calls. So uh, a lot of these dots are on zero. So as soon as we started the playback, these are blackbirds were jumping into action and responding to blue jays, whereas they tended to wait a little bit longer for cowbird chatter, seat, and wet thrush song to the point where they weren't statistically significant from each other. Um, so definitely responding a lot more quickly to blue jay than these other calls. Um, and so I have kind of like a taken together slide for each of these measures so that in case you forgot what the incubation stage looks like, you can see it both. Um, both graphs are scaled equally. So if this is 600 seconds up here, it's also 600 here. So you can easily see, you know, differences in patterns. Um, and so taken together, both these stages, what we can see is that males respond more quickly to cowbird chatter and seek calls when cowbird parasitism is a threat. So during incubation stage is when they're responding really quickly to cowbird chowder and seat. Um, not so much during nestling stage when these aren't a threat anymore. They are responding very quickly to blue jays though. When we look at alarm calling, uh, we see kind of a similar pattern where uh, they, yes, they are alarm calling some to cowbird chowder and seat, but it's not statistically different from wood thrush song. It's just that when blackbirds tend to alarm call a lot. However, we see a lot of alarm calls to blue jay calls um, and it's statistically significant from the other treatments. So they are alarm calling much more to the nest predator than they are to these other treatments. Oh, I also wanted to note um, that this slide only includes males that had nests with uh, only nestlings on territory because actually when I included the egg data, I found that it affected the cowbird chatter treatment where this went up. So. Um, males that still had nests of eggs in the territory, they don't seem to just switch over to nestling uh, mode right away. They seem to still remember the fact that they have eggs in their territory and they'll still be very aggressive to cowbirds. But once they don't have eggs in their territory, they seem to kind of become more lax and ignore the cowbird. Um, so I thought that was really cool. So this, this nest just for the sake of 
showing an easy pattern, um, it only includes the nestling data. So if we take this all together, we again find this pattern where um, males are producing alarm calls more to cowbird chatter and seek calls, uh, at least in comparison to the control, only when cowbird parasitism is a threat. So we don't see these aggressive responses during nestling stage. Um, and you can also see the importance of, I guess, having both stages here because the number of alarm calls really didn't change uh, to these two treatments from um, incubation to nestling, but the difference with the nest predator did. So rubbing blackbirds aren't really so much dropping their aggression a ton to cowbird chatter and seat, they're just uh, ramping it up to the nest predator instead. So let's go to the females. Um, same exact pattern as we saw for the males. So uh, the females tend to, you can see these dots up here at 600. It means that most females for both cowbird chatter, seat, and wood thrush treatments don't even respond to them. Like they just go the whole entire trial, they're on their nest, they just ignore it. Although um, during the blue jay trial, most females respond and a majority of them respond immediately or within the first 30 seconds. Um, so females really show this very pattern where they are responding to the nest predator, but essentially ignoring the cowbird chatter, the seat, and the wood thrush song, which is the control. So our taken together slide, females show the same pattern where they only seem to care about cowbird chatter and seat calls when cowbird parasitism is a threat to their nest, so when they have eggs. Okay, and finally, if we look at alarm calling of females, again, females don't tend to alarm call that much uh, compared to males, but we still see this statistical pattern where um, they are alarm calling much more to the blue jay call than they are to the cowbird chatter, the seat, or the wood thrush song. So they pretty much um, are ignoring these other treatments because the cowbirds aren't a threat. So again, same, same exact pattern again, um, where they are ignoring cowbirds and seat calls, uh, when they're not a threat, but they focus on them during incubation when they are. So summarizing the nestling stage, here we see both male and female red-winged blackbirds respond equally to cowbird chatter, seat calls, and the control. And that the most aggression they give um, is towards the blue jay, which is the nest predator at this point. So this is similar to what other studies see with the models. It's just now we have um, the seat call thrown in. Um, and aggression towards the predator seems to increase as we go to nestling stage. So what does that mean conclusion-wise? What, what does all this mean together? Uh, well, for one, rubbing blackbirds seem to respond as quickly and with similar aggression to cowbird chatter and seat call. So they're treating them almost identically. And what's really interesting is that responses to these two calls is mediated by brood parasitism risk. So um, during incubation stage, when they're very at risk for this cowbird parasitism, that's when they're paying attention to the cowbird chatter. That's when the seat call is being treated just like cowbird chatter and treated as a threat versus um, when they are in nestling stage and cowbirds really aren't a threat at that point, um, they tend to ignore cowbird and seat calls while paying attention to nest predators and other threats instead. So my big takeaway is that red-winged blackbirds do eavesdrop on yellow warbler seat calls, and they seem to treat them as a signal for brood parasitic danger. And why I think this is the coolest takeaway from my PhD is because actually, if you look through the literature, this is the first example of header-specific eavesdropping on a referential signal for brood parasitism. So we have a lot of examples of this stuff on predator example yet. Uh, for a referential signal on brute parasitism. And part of the reason for that is because if you go with the strict definition for a referential signal, the yellow warbler is the only one that does it um, for brute parasitism. So this is, this is really cool stuff and I'm really excited to share it. Um, let's see, I'm 40 minutes in, okay, yeah. So I, this wouldn't be possible obviously without my team. Um, I have some of them here in a picture. Uh, people from my lab that help with the stats, um, people on my committee, my funding sources here. Um, and uh, I have my Twitter handle here if anyone's interested. And this is the Coward Labs Twitter handle. Um, but yeah, I just got to acknowledge all these people because this is not possible to do without all of them and with all the funding and help. And uh, I, have time, I have a lot of time for questions, apparently. Um, and while you ask your questions, please enjoy in this video of me getting destroyed by a rubbing blackbird on loop. <laughs> They're just very mean when you're checking their nests. <laughs> uh, thanks, Shelby. This was a, a very interesting talk. I especially like the videos. 
Oh yeah, I, I thought they were really, really cute. It was so funny. I never thought I'd include those in a presentation. It was more just like, oh, you're going to the mean nest. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a video of you getting hit by these revving blackbirds. <laughs> it reminds me of, um, of uh, when I was growing up, uh, I used to have to run from our house to my grandparents' house, which was on the farm, not far, like 400 meters, but there were these lap wings and they like kept on like buzzing me and like kicking me on the back of my head. It was, yeah. But yeah, and these guys terrified. have some heft to them. Like when he slapped my hat, I was shocked by how much heft that bird had yeah. when he kicked me. <laughs> For sure. So um, if you have a question, you're welcome to type it in the chat box or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it. Um, I had a question. Um, I was wondering, Shelby, um, if you know whether blue jays, um, do they mainly predate on nestlings or do they also eat, um, actually eat the eggs? It's both. Um, you're probably going to see more often eggs just because uh, just they're probably a lot easier to consume quickly. Um, but yeah, it's both. So when they've done dissections of blue jays in the past, like their stomach contents included both. And, and there's actual like eyewitness of them eating it too. Um, they're not like our top nest predator in our system, but they, they work as a good um, warning call for them. Cool. Um, and then there was a question. There's so many questions. Uh, why do yellow warblers not kick out the cowbird eggs? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, I should have, I could always share my screen and include a picture um, that I have a cool picture for this. So for one thing, um, they are considered an acceptor species. So if they have a bunch of eggs and a cowbird egg is one of them, they often just can't tell the difference. Like they haven't evolved to be able to tell difference between these two different types of eggs. Um, and uh, Mark Halver, who's my PA, I could tell you a lot more about that because he studies that. Um, but that's one of the things is that if the cowbird lays it after they've already laid a bunch of eggs, they often just can't even tell that it's there. So they, they see no reason to kick it out. Um, if the cowbird lays it early on um, and if the yellow warbler does notice it, which does sometimes happen if it's like the first or second egg in the nest, because um, they'll be like, I didn't lay that. <laughs> um, if they see that, the thing is they're kind of small, so they can't physically eject the net, the egg, like they can't get their beak around it and they can't kick it out of the nest. So they'll either just abandon, which is the most uh, common option when they can tell they've been parasitized and they'll just start elsewhere. But also here, I'm gonna, um, oops, sorry. Give me a second. I have a photo of their other defense that I will pull up so you can see it. Because they have a couple cool defenses. Okay, there we go. And then share screen. So this is a photo of a roofed nest. So if they can tell they've been parasitized, sometimes they'll just take more fluff and build over the cowbird egg and just start over. Um, so you can see that the bottom part of this nest is very dark. So this is the old nest. Um, we saw that a cowbird had laid its egg in the nest and it just built new fluff over it. And it's like, I'll start over. Um, so sometimes they do this instead, which is cool. But a lot of times they just abandon because if they do this, sometimes the cowbird comes back because it knows where the nest is and lays another egg and then they roof it again. And just it, at some point they just give up and move on. But sometimes this works. Cool, cool. Um, and then Sarah asked, uh, what's your favorite part of working with these birds? With the rubbing blackbirds or the yellow warblers? <laughs> I guess the rubbing blackbirds, I would assume. <laughs> well, both of them. <laughs> yeah, both, Shelby. Oh, no. Uh, well, the rubbing blackbirds, they're, they're really aggressive and it's kind of fun to watch them like really defend their territories. I love when we do playback, sometimes they'll run off and we're like, where are they going? They have a playback happening and you'll see this giant hawk going overhead and they'll just be this little tiny repping blackbird following it and pecking at it like, get out of my territory. So they're just so strong and so uh, so brave standing up for <laughs> their nest and their territory. And they, they tend to help the birds around them too by being so muscular and, and helping them out. Um, and they're super pretty too, both the male and female look really nice. Um, the yellow warblers I really like because they're so cute and small. Um, they're really nice when handling them like in the hand. So I've done stuff uh, with like measuring their hormones or just banding them. So we get a banded population and they're so nice because they just fall in the net and instead of uh, getting like tangled in the net or struggling, they just kind of lay there and are like, all right, put this band on me. <laughs> they're so nice and easy to hold and they're real soft. Um, 
but I don't know, the receipt calls, honestly, the coolest thing. Like, it's really cool to just put out a cowbird model or put out a playback and just watch a female go up next to it and go like, see, 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 and run back to her nest and sit on it. Like, you can just see the behavior in action. Mm -hmm. So cool. That is cute. Um, and there was a question of whether you can please repeat the recordings of the different calls. I'll go back to the beginning. And Sarah also just mentioned that Mark Albert did give a great talk for CCAS. And maybe since we now have an inside man, uh, we can um, convince him to come back, <laughs> give another talk. Yeah, I'm sure he would love that. And then you can ask more questions about how birds can't tell apart eggs that look so obvious to us. Um, really cool research that he's done a lot on. So here's the seat call. So it's really high pitched, really short. I think it does sound like seat. It really does just like seat, 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 seat. Um, and then, whoop, and then the chip call is here. So this is the one they just do in general. It, this is how we locate yellow warblers when we're looking for, um, starting out in this season, we're looking for their territory so we can start looking for nests. We usually just listen for chip calls because they'll be doing it um, whenever they see that our male, uh, they'll, they'll also sing, which helps, but chip calls really help us figure out and hone on like where a nest is. And they'll do this a lot. Cool. Um, there was another question. Um, is it possible or likely that red wings might respond to the warning calls of species other than yellow warblers? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, if they're already listening in on yellow warbler calls, uh, they could just be, oh, here I, oops, I gotta share it again. They could just be uh, a species that listens in on other alarm calls and learns them. Um, they're kind of like sentinels. So the, the thing that makes our winged blackbirds a little different from other birds that would be nesting near other warblers is that um, they have these huge territories which they have multiple females on. And so because they have multiple females, they don't um, participate that much in like helping out with the chicks. Like they'll feed them a little, but they mostly just watch over the nests throughout the different stages. So their whole job is just to watch over their territory and kick away predators and call about risks. So they're kind of set up nicely to pick in this information and either they, they know it innately or they learn it somehow. Maybe they hear it and it gets paired with the sight of a cowbird and they're like, oh, those two things are linked. Um, but they do seem to pick up this. So I don't see why they wouldn't uh, pay attention to other birds alarm calls that around them. That would make sense. Cool. And then um, let's see, uh, Megan asked uh, first, she says, fascinating work, Shelby, and an excellent talk. Um, question, your latency measurements show how rapidly the birds respond to the calls. Amazingly fast. How long does it take for them to call to calm down afterwards? Um, probably more than 10 minutes. Uh, in fact, we usually, uh, if we ever had to test a bird twice, we'd always wait at least 24 hours. I'm sure it doesn't take them that long, but we wanted to be really sure because um, we could test them and we might look around for other nests and come back in like a half hour, an hour, and they'll still be a little agitated. Um, I, I don't think it affects them the rest of their day. Uh, as far as like being angry about it, um, but they do seem to remember it. And actually that's a good segue. I did include other stuff I do on here because I figured that might come up. Um, sorry, not that, this one. So I do know, even if it doesn't affect them, like I, I, I really don't know like what their hormones are like the next day. We don't know what their behavior so much is like the next day uh, in terms of being angry about the call or stressed. But we do know they remember the fact that they heard it. Um, and this is from another thing that is actually, it's not published, but we're submitting it like in the next week or two. Um, so this is something I did last year where we were like, okay, we know that they run back to their nest and sit on it when they hear a cowbird or a seat call. The problem is we can say all we want that, oh, it prevents parasitism because the cowbird can't get in the nest. The thing is cowbirds don't lay during the middle of the day. They lay at dawn. And so what use is it running back to your nest if it's like noon or two o'clock if a cowbird is not even interested in laying an egg at that time? Um, 
And of course it can keep them from inspecting the nest, but there has to be more to it, right? So we were wondering, does the next day, do females remember the fact that they heard the sea call and does it alter their nest setting behavior? So do they sit maybe on their nest more often or keep like vigilance on the area um, to make sure cowbirds don't come? So we actually uh, did this last summer where I, um, we would play these different calls uh, three days in a row and it would be random on each day. So we usually start with silence and then the next day would be either seed or chip and then the next day would be whatever one they didn't get. Um, and so then we come each day afterwards and watch them the hour after dawn when cowbirds lay. Uh, we'd either stake the nest visually um, or we put this little button in it that measures temperature and you can just tell when the bird gets on and off the nest. Uh, and so we wanted to measure the number of times the bird got off the nest. And so, oh, uh, shout out to Sarah who's here. Um, they took this great video. And so if you wanna follow them, there's their uh, Twitter of a yellow warbler early in the morning coming back to their nest checking it out and sitting on it so cute <laughs> a little fluffy <laughs> um but here's the data so um these are our different nests we tested and so what this is is that we took the number of times um, they got off each of these three different treatments and we subtracted the silence so that if it's in the negatives it means the birds got off less times after this treatment compared to silence. And if it's in the positive, it, it means that the bird got off more times after that treatment compared to silence. Um, and so what we show here is that compared to chip calls, they get off the nest less um, after hearing a seek call the previous day than they do after hearing chips. So they seem to be responding to the fact that seat calls uh, happened the previous day and they're sitting more tightly on their nest to prevent you know, a cowbird from coming up and inspecting it. This was a small sample size and it's, it's not like a huge statistical difference, but it is significant. Um, we need more data, but this is still really cool because it's like the first example of showing that they actually do something after hearing a seat call. Um, and they're not just, oh, sit on your nest and ignore it after that. Uh, so, so yeah, there you go. So the um, anger wise are getting stressed, um, probably not more than like an hour. I'm sure it's, uh, they're good after like half hour, but they do remember the next day, which is really, really neat. Cool. Somebody actually had a, a specific question about um, sitting on the, on their nest. So um, the question is yellow warblers apparently respond to a sea call by flying to their nest and sitting on and covering their eggs. Is it possible that this is a learned response by warblers who have nested ex or nesting experience or is it an inherited response? That's such a good question and I haven't gotten to look at that yet, but it should be known somewhat soon because we're hand raising warblers this summer um, in order to see like what is the developmental response to this. So I'll try playing seat calls to them and, and test their hormones. Um, we have an fMRI machine we plan on using so we can see not only on experienced warblers where these uh, things are happening in the brain in a very ethical way where the bird can be released afterwards, um, but also we'll do it on naive warblers and see do they treat this information the same way? Are they listening and, and uh, is it something they know how to do? Like do they understand what a seek call is having never heard it or is it just doesn't mean nothing to them without experience? We do, um, there are some past studies, there's one by Sharon Gill that looked at um, yellow warblers are different experience. So it was like first year nesting yellow warblers versus yellow warblers that were older and had nested multiple years. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've been parasitized, but they've had experience with nesting. Um, and the older warblers responded more strongly to seek calls than yellow warblers that were their first season. Um, so. And it, uh, the younger ones still responded aggressively, just not to the same extent. So there's probably some kind of experience dependent thing there. Um, even if they did know it innately, something has to get linked to the experience of nesting and parasitism for that to happen. But good question. Hopefully I'll have that in another year or two. Maybe I'll have some answers. You can come back and give another talk. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> Um, and then there is a question, uh, does the warbler sitting on the nest prevent the cowbird from laying an egg there or does the cowbird try to drive the warbler away? Yeah, I guess that kind of gets at this, right? Where like the, it doesn't exactly um, prevent it because the cowbird often won't come in that moment to lay. Like they, they generally just lay at dawn um, and then that's the only time that they lay. I do, 
Uh, no, I don't know if it's for yellow warblers, but I've seen other small birds, like videos of them sitting on their nest and a cowbird just comes along and push them off and still lay an egg. So I'm sure if a cowbird really wanted to, it could push them off. Like they're so much bigger than a yellow warbler. Um, but you know, if she's on a nest and her male is being really vigilant and attacks the cowbird, then um, he might, they might not uh, attempt to lay, but they, they certainly could push them out of the way if they want to. Um, but the cowbird also has to consider is that like worth their time because they're going to take some damage from any violence that these yellow warblers cause on them. Um, but it might be worth their time to just lay elsewhere. Plus the other, uh, the sorry, the cowbirds have to take into account what stage the nest is at, how many eggs have been laid, like to figure out the best time to lay because you don't want to lay if these eggs have already been sat on for like ten days. Um, and so cowbirds are really smart because they actually keep all the information in their head and are able to memorize. Uh, where nests are and what stage they're in. So it could be so much like, even though the cowbird could push the yellow warbler out of the nest at dawn if it wants to, if it's not able to check the nest either during the day um, because the yellow warbler ran back and sat on it and it can't check it the next morning because the yellow warbler is still sitting on it. Uh, at that point, it's, it's like, is it worth it to even lay here or should it go to a nest that it knows is in the right stage? That's a good question though. Um. Do juvenile red-winged blackbirds respond to seeds? Um, how old do they need to be to begin to respond? And then also just to comment that it's a very interesting talk. And thank you. Um, yeah, yes, there's another developmental question that I don't know, but hopefully we're also hand-raising red-winged blackbirds. So maybe I'll know that in another year. Um, I'll, I'll try to play them some seed calls and see what they do. Um, it'd be super cool. I, I have a feeling they also probably need experience. Um, the, the yellow warblers, Certainly, I could see some innate ability there that just gets paired with experience and becomes stronger. I'm guessing the, the red winged blackbirds will need to be able to see like a seat call or sorry, hear seat calls and see a cowbird to to make those kind of connections. But I guess we'll see that that'll be really cool to look at. Um, and then there is a question. Um, what were your criteria for telling a red winged blackbird response to a call uh, that is the, the bird under observation have to approach the speaker within a particular distance? If so, then how did you determine what distance constituted a significant response? Um, say, for example, it approaches five meters, that is a response, but if it's six meters, it's not considered a response. Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually do have approach data. I just didn't include it in the talk because um, it's not as clean cut as the other stuff and it takes longer to go through it. Um, but we had a 30 meter um, radius or sorry 30 meter yeah 30 meter radius around the speaker so 60 meters total of a diameter on a, a circle around it um, and so that was relevant because red wing blackbird territories are generally uh 60 to like 75 meters is like their their kind of cap yes they could be bigger than that um, but that, that would be like their average size and so we would put it on near the nest assuming that like that's going to encompass most of the territory and the big blackbird should respond if it's within there. Um, and so if it went outside 30 meters during the playback, it wouldn't be canceled out of the playback, but we would just mark that it was outside during that turn and not to count it. Um, and we marked behaviors. Uh, I marked stuff every minute as far as um, like what, uh, what uh, how close it was to the nest. Um, but then for calls or latency, those were just counted as continuous data. So if it went outside the 30 meters and called, we didn't count that. But as soon as it was within the 30 meter range, um, we counted everything it did. And so um, for the approach data, I will say uh, the one cool thing was that that's where we saw a difference between cowbird and seat calls, um, where the cowbird call they got really close to, but then the seat call, it was really far away from. Uh, and I have a feeling that's because for cowbird calls, they get close to try to find the cowbird, whereas the seat call, you're not trying to beat up the messenger. So like, why why approach the seat call when you're more like, oh, where's the cowbird? Um, so for those guys, they would like fly around their territory looking for the cowbird. Cool, and then our last question is, what about this warbler, blackbird, cowbird system? Do you recommend studying next? Um, Definitely the developmental question would be cool that people pose. I, I have to know like what they're doing um, and how they learn it. 
Uh, I think the brain stuff for fMRI is really cool because I've always wanted to learn how to do like neurobiology. Um, and we have a brand new fMRI machine so the birds can be safely uh, tested and then they can be released, which is really cool. And so I want to know, you know, we really don't know what referential calls are doing in the brain. Um, but I'm interested in language and it's kind of as close as animals are going to get to language is having a call that means something specific. It's like a word that we have. Um, so it'd be neat to see where that's happening in the brain and if it's linked to like um, the amygdala, like to their different stress that they're feeling, maybe it's linked to the occipital lobes and their, uh, where they're visualizing, I don't know, the object. We just don't know anything about it. So that's, that's another thing I want to look at next too. And that, that would be for both, uh, uh, sorry, yellow warblers and for rubbing blackbirds because they don't, rubbing blackbirds don't make the seed calls, so like where they process it is also really cool information. Cool. Um, well, thanks again, Shelby. This was a really fascinating talk and I'm sure everybody agrees. Um, and I mean, the question should give you an indication how much people enjoyed it. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. Um, and so thank you everybody for joining us. And I will post this on our YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if I posted the link, but I can quickly copy it and paste it in there in case you want to share this with anybody. And I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Thank you, Shelby. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you. Very interesting program. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>